I remember when me and my brother got our first PlayStation. It was one of those slim versions, an adorable little thing. As a kid, you're never really too picky about what games you get given, at least not back then. Anything would have been better than doing schoolwork or chores or just watching plain old TV. So I would have been happy with pretty much anything my dad or older brother would have picked out. The first of which was the infallibly classic Rayman. I think this was what held most of my attention as a kid at first. What caught my attention slightly less was a whopping four disc case with a quirky looking party of five on the cover. That was Final Fantasy IX. But little did I know that Final Fantasy IX would probably be the game that dominated my life for the next five years at least. What Final Fantasy IX immediately impressed me with, apart from being four whole discs, was the presentation, as soon as the opening notes of the title screen began to play. We may have been young, but I knew good music when I heard it, and I knew amazing visuals when I saw them. Walking around the town as Vivi at first didn't grip me hugely. Not knowing where to go, having to read NPC dialogue, feeling a jump rope, it's a bit of a slow burn. My RPG experience up until this point probably went as far as playing the first two generations of Pokemon, and a vague memory of playing a small PC demo of Final Fantasy VII, where you just battled in the gold saucer. Final Fantasy IX was just captivating enough to where I had to stick with it. The play was phenomenal, getting to level up in the evil forest was satisfying. Satisfying. The escape from the forest left me gobsmacked, and the world map? Oh, it just felt like pure freedom. Those moments in school where all you ever looked forward to were those vacations at the end of a term or semester, where your time was finally in your hands and the world was yours to explore, leaving all the books and hard work behind to go outside basking in wide open fields. Final Fantasy IX just embodied this feeling for me. Fond memories of just chilling at home during summer vacation controller in hand, the sun gently coming through the window, playing through the events of Dali Village, to the tune of a soft cozy melody in a quiet sleepy town. A stark contrast to when the war with Alexandria started and people actually started dying left and right, including my own party. It's kind of a subtle thematic genius that as soon as the dark wartime atmosphere is introduced into the game, the gameplay itself took a jump in difficulty to where, as a kid, I felt the imminent danger. I was scared. I probably bought like a million potions and dreaded every other random encounter. When these clowns said that their general was scary, I got really 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 scared. And then we fought her to her somber dramatic theme tune, and she one shot every single party member. And I just couldn't deal with it. The thought of loss, a genuine loss, just was crazy, and I really respect the game for instilling that fear of loss into me. A testament to how much I enjoyed the experience of just playing through the first disc was the fact that for probably an entire summer vacation, I played through Final Fantasy IX every day, without a memory card. Yes, for those of you who are unfamiliar, that means no saving. Every day, hoping that there wouldn't be any distractions, I'd wake up and try to do things differently, get further than I ever had before, only to be forced to shut down the console come bedtime and start the process again the next day. And I really did that. And it was so much fun! It was only up until probably the next year that we finally obtained a memory card so I could actually save the game. I was ready, and for every vacation period for at least the next 5 years, Final Fantasy IX was always on my list of things to play, slowly getting through it with nothing more than my own young wits and replaying it when I did, probably THE game of my childhood. And so the mere concept of there perhaps being a remake on the horizon has me feeling all kinds of ways. On one hand, I'm skeptical of what such an endeavor might choose to go for. It could try to pull a Final Fantasy VII remake, a rather unrealistic goal considering that Final Fantasy VII Remake is still in play and is taking a whole decade to develop the full experience. It could attempt to do something completely faithful, bordering on a remaster, which would be an okay-ish proposition but effectively still just a port with a paint job. 
frankly, I'm not too sure about either of these two approaches cause the former threatens to stray rather far and bite off a bit more than it can chew, while the latter is still fairly low effort and doesn't bring much to the table that would actually entice me to play it over the simple Steam version, with the Moguri mod and all its extra features. Having seen the short demo that was put together by the team on the Memoria project, I can say that this type of approach to remaking the map environment is actually perfectly fine. It was giving Fable vibes, but still very quintessentially Final Fantasy IX in nature, which is a great combination. There's only so many ways to modernize the general field navigation gameplay in these Final Fantasy games anyway. It doesn't take a genius to know that you can't really shift Final Fantasy IX's character models into looking like Final Fantasy XVI's, but apart from aesthetics, it's not hard to expect how the general field maps of the game will end up being improved. The real issues come from how they choose to do the world maps, the battles, and extra story and lore, and to some extent, the minigames. There's been so much discourse on world maps and airships in Final Fantasy games, especially since Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Final Fantasy XVI are the current case studies of the modern approaches to such. The way I see it, they can either stylize the game to where they can appropriately keep the same world map approach that the original did, or pull an expanded Final Fantasy VII Rebirth approach, which I find highly unlikely. I'm sure they know better than to convert the vast, interactable, treasure-filled world map of Final Fantasy IX to a Final Fantasy XVI or Final Fantasy X fast travel system, and I have no current concerns for it. For me, there are three areas of a Final Fantasy IX remake that I'd really want to see some thought put into when it comes to improving the original game. Three areas that are not guaranteed to be done well, especially if they're just done exactly as they were before, and do in fact need to be addressed for me to consider the game to be a successful remake worthy of an old fans time. What a cast of characters! Final Fantasy IX has a lot of iconic characters, many of whom have specific highlights and moments in the game that either really resonate with players on a personal level, or at least are a big enough deal in the context of the story that they're really memorable. But not every character's story in the main party is treated with such an equal amount of care or attention. This, in part, can be due to the time in which the party member is recruited, because of course, with less screen time, the less opportunity a character has to shine. But even with this handicap, characters should still be able to shine through with the little time they have. Everyone remembers things like Vivi's existential crisis. Same goes for Garnett and her heavy responsibility and guilt in being a princess during a time of war. Steiner's arc comes to a head a bit earlier in the plot due to his sporadic involvement in the main party, but he still has marked moments where his stubborn personality shifts in realization to what's going on around him. He even gets a little romance of his own. Aiko's a later character and in of herself she's more effective in roles of comedy and providing some information but she makes a mark for her six-year-old character despite this. You can see past her little crush on Zidane and brazen loud attitude to see the fear and loneliness within, as her jealousy of Garnet turns into friendship and sisterhood. Interestingly enough, while Aiko and Steiner both have small arcs that don't really last long, they always feel more relevant than Freya, whose story is very isolated to one section of the game that only lasts a few hours. If you add them up, it's probably the same amount of time that Steiner and Aiko get, but it's the sectioning of her part that really hurts Freya. She has to deal with the loss of her kingdom and her relationship with her lost love all at once. But once it happens, it doesn't really get resolved for her until the very end, in a way that didn't necessarily have anything to do with the main struggle. It's like they just forgot her halfway into writing the game. Who are you? Again? It's weird. I feel like I'm forgetting something really important. She feels sidelined because her highlights simply stop a third of the way through the game, and in a lot of ways, she doesn't really need to be here after that. While Vivi deals with his existence and Garnet deals with her guilt, Steiner's concerned for his queen and country, and Aiko's looking for family. Quinna's even trying to master the way of the gourmand. Freya is just helping. Which, to be fair, is what Zidane's also doing, but by exhibiting Zidane's feelings about the party members he's helping, mostly Vivi and Garnet, you can see where his heart lies throughout, beyond the point that he's already solidified himself as the helpful guy. Not to mention, he has his own defining moments near the end of the game. 
I don't doubt that Freya's heart lies with making the world a safe place for her kingdom to revive itself, but it all seems like a noble distraction for her. Like fighting to keep your mind off of a tragedy. Maybe if they gave her some more motivation to actually find Fratley again on her journey, and to say something to him that she didn't before, she might have a driving force that could resonate with the player. She was very selfless when she let Fratley go without pressing him, like Zidane encouraged. But I feel like somewhere in between, she could have realized that even if she couldn't have the relationship be what it was in the past, she can still make new memories with him now. And maybe that's worth chasing after. For a remake, I'd want them to give Freya more goals past her kingdom's destruction, and actually insert Fratley somewhere in hopes that they rekindle their love. Fighting without hope is no way to live. It's just a way to die. I feel like this isn't too tall an ask, because at the worst, it's probably just an added few lines of dialogue in a possible active time event from Freya. And maybe putting Fratley somewhere in the world map as an NPC? I mean, Lani makes another appearance, why not him? Just because it's not closely tied to the overall story doesn't mean it doesn't give a character more weight, especially when it comes to the grander themes of the game regarding memory and existence. As an example, I point to Quina, a very quirky and disregardable character. When the player actually invests as much effort into Quina's development as Quail encourages, you see key scenes that actually elevate the concept of what Quina is about, despite their seemingly simple personality. Through them and by extension Vivi, you get a very poignant message about imagination, what it means to exist, expand, and what it means to be happy. While it may seem rather ethereal in concept, it's actually a fairly decent lesson about perspective and limitations. This scene alone elevated Quina's entire character story for me personally on a subsequent playthrough, and finishing their own quest to eat everything and defeat their master just felt more satisfying as a result. It made Quina feel like a relevant party member who was emblematic of what the party fights for in the end. And what really helped it stand out more than Freya's arc is that it's something that gets done after the halfway point of the game. But what happens when a character is actually introduced at the halfway point? Let's talk about Amaranth. Who warned you about Unalak? I did. Who got you into the movers? I did. Who saved your company? I did. Who got you thrown in jail? I did. Oh yeah, I guess that was a bad thing. Anyone who's played through Final Fantasy IX knows that Amaranth has some of the weaker character development going on. A lot of people barely use him as a result of that, which not even his decent spread of abilities can fix. While I see the seeds for a decent character storyline in him, I feel that much like Freya, his potential was somewhat wasted. Probably why they enjoy pairing the two of them together near the end of the game so much. They just throw the rejects together in the corner. Amaranth is introduced as a mercenary, hired to get back Garnet, and of his own volition, take down Zidane. Upon being defeated, he doesn't understand Zidane's merciful victory, and follows along due to his incomprehension, all the while being standoffish and rather antisocial. You learn later that he was once a guard in Treno, who was tricked and framed by Zidane, into becoming a wanted man. Amaranth may have bore a grudge for that, but what he seems even more preoccupied with is understanding Zidane's personality, as even before before he was framed, his personality was still very opposite to Zidane, what with wanting to fight all the time. Some time into traveling with the party, Amaranth gets fed up and tries to prove that going solo is more efficient, but he gets into a bit of a pickle as a result, and Zidane coming to save him has him warm up a bit more to what Zidane is all about after which he finally starts doing his cool victory pose in battle. This signifies the end of most of Amaranth's development. He has a few scenes afterward that reinforce that he has in fact changed. And that's good, only unlike Freya, Amaranth's problem isn't what comes after the big turning point in his story, but what comes before, how little of him we actually get access to, and how little both we and Zidane understand him as a result. The extent to which he's baffled by Zidane being so friendly, to where it seems more important to him than the fact that Zidane ruined his life, is kinda too strange for me to just write off and accept. No one else in the party is that surprised at how accommodating Zidane is. Everyone else kind of appreciates it or shrugs it off. For the record, Amaranth should be more mad about what Zidane did to him. It'd give his motivation more impact, in my opinion. But back to understanding him, I feel like they really squandered the potential of his backstory and setting up who he is 
They give us certain points, but they don't quite hit home with the consequences. Amaranth's stoicism and nonchalant attitude are off-putting, and he has an odd obsession with superiority in combat, believing that the weak losers must perish and the strong survive. His first memory is, allegedly, of some person he had to fight. While many can dismiss this as the game trying a bit hard to make him seem cool or edgy, it's also a very telling point about his past. Presumably born in Treno, which may not be the case, but likely. With an attitude and aptitude like his, Amaranth clearly has a rough past, which places him as likely being a slum dweller, likely orphaned, abandoned, or just with bad parents. If he was struggling to survive, he'd probably have encountered some unsavory characters daily, growing up to fight his way past. He also may have had to exert some brute force to even just feed himself. I could easily see him participating in some underground fighting ring at the behest of some sleazy crime lord or even some corrupt noble. To so heavily reinforce the archaic ideals that Amrit has about battle and self-reliance, I feel like he must have been part of a community that just bolstered that way of thinking. Amrit's abilities hint that he's experienced in classic ninja and monk work, which is a combination that reinforces his identity as a competently trained fighter while also being someone who takes up a lot of discreet mercenary jobs. He's not a thief in principle, but he does retain a couple of thief traits and abilities like flea gill, or just the ability to equip thief items. Assuming Amaranth likely grew up in the grammier side of Treno life, it's actually pretty remarkable that he ended up with a decent guard gig for a Treno noble. As the game is, I think Amaranth takes these jobs specifically to find a challenge, but a part of me thinks that it would have made his character more sympathetic if him working contracts was actually a way for him to get out of the seedy side of slum life. He'd still love a good fight, but elevating himself out of the slums by working legitimate jobs should have meant more to him. It's the type of elevation other slum dwellers could only dream about. It may be a bit of an odd comparison, but this character has a very similar setup to this character, and yet one capitalizes on it while the other does not. So when Monkey Boy arrives to scam him out of his gig and his fought for a good name, Amaranth should have been a little more pissed. It should have set him back forced him into that life of kill or be killed once again, always struggling and ultimately pushing him to leave Treno and find Zidane. These are just examples of highlights that the game could have used or hinted at more. Amaranth's full backstory is still shrouded in a bit of mystery and we don't have details about why he is the way he is and that's a really important step in having people buy into his character development which is all about not being the way he is anymore. Leaving his backstory behind, I feel like one of Amaranth's biggest issues is how late he shows up. An ATE or two would have at least set the stage for him being yet another encroaching threat to our party. Maybe scenes of him being chased out or ostracized for being a wanted man, and seeing just how much he's persecuted despite not really doing anything. While ATEs can do a lot, they can only do so much before they get overbearing, so the rest of the heavy lifting for his character needs to be done during his confrontations with Zidane. He may not want to say it outright from their first meeting, but he should have had a moment where he confronted Zidane with an actual grudge. Zidane ruined his gig and forced him back into a lifestyle that reinforced his loner persona in the first place. This could have also been a nice opportunity for Zidane to be a little considerate of the people he hurts as collateral damage during his little heists. I'm sorry, I don't remember any of it. You don't remember? For me, it was Tuesday. Seeing as his life is ruined and he couldn't even get revenge on Zidane, him wanting Zidane to leave him or finish him off at Ibsen's castle could also tie into just wanting his crappy life to end. Amaranth doesn't believe in the power of friendship. He's had to elevate himself by himself. It's not like trusting others would have actually ever went well for him in Treno. Whether they want to put more emphasis on Amaranth's confusions about Zidane's way of life, or on Amaranth's struggle in getting over the effects of his past, either way, I think they have to put in more backstory. Every other party member has a better semblance of what their life is before joining the party, and so have a better springboard when they develop. Also, a remake of Final Fantasy IX should kinda improve the sequence whereby Zidane frames Amaranth. It's pretty silly as it is. I mean, maybe it's supposed to be for laughs? Freya definitely thinks it's funny, but it doesn't quite hit for me. So rather than be comedic, I'd prefer it actually be more believable and kinda serious. I don't know, I just think it should be done better. 
A lot of purists would say that they'd prefer the battle system untouched, and as a fan of the ATB system myself, I gotta say, I heavily disagree with that statement, or at least the literal implications of it. A lot of casual or first-time players may not notice this about Final Fantasy IX's ATB system in comparison to others, but a few of the elements of Final Fantasy IX's combat are kind of broken fundamentally, not just with regard to their effectiveness. The ATB system, for those who don't know, revolved around the continuous passage of time in battle. A character is able to select their next move when their ATB bar is filled, and when they do, their action is added to the queue of already selected actions. If other characters have already selected their moves, then you gotta wait for theirs to go off first. But there is a key difference in the ATB of Final Fantasy IX versus other Final Fantasy games that came before it. Here is a clip of a basic spell being cast in Final Fantasy IV, Final Fantasy VII, and Final Fantasy IX. Observe closely and see if you can spot the difference I'm thinking of. So if you noticed, while the spell was being cast, in Final Fantasy IX, the ATB bar continued to move along, whereas in Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy IV, the ATB pauses during the animation. Now considering Final Fantasy IX has you controlling four party members, and animation can be rather long, you might be thinking that it's better for the ATB to not wait while a move is being animated. However, this creates a rather understated problem. When the execution of a move is delayed by another move's animation, the effect of time via ATB becomes rather pointless. Take this summoning sequence for example. It lasts about under a minute, in which time every single character on the field, no matter how fast or how slow, has had an opportunity to select their next move. And because they all must wait for each other's animations to finish before they can execute their own, it ends up creating a cycle where the character or enemy that just finished their own animation will almost always be added to the back of the line creating a very static or fixed turn order. And in a game where everyone has a speed stat, it almost renders that stat useless. I say almost because of course if everyone is doing quickly animated attacks, this phenomenon occurs less. A character's inherent speed may matter at the start of a battle when it comes to deciding the looping turn order. Not to mention that if you set the ATB to its slowest setting, then there is actually a chance that a character can finish their long spell animation before everyone else has had the chance to refill their own ATB bars. But this inconsistency based on battle animations is what creates an issue. Not only does it undermine the speed stat, but it also completely compromises the systems of buffs and debuffs in the game. Defensive spells, countdown timers, reflecting and defending. Status effects are often dictated by lengths of time. How long a status lasts and what it means for the target is directly connected to the ATB. And in a game where time passes, despite the battle coming to a standstill, this proves detrimental. You might cast a defensive spell on your party only for it to wear off before the enemy does a single attack. Or the enemy might cast a doom counter on your party, and you can't do anything about it before it finishes because your summon animation took the entire doom counter's duration to finish. On the other hand, the broken ATB system might come in handy for the player. After all, accelerated healing from regen while waiting for a summon animation to finish could mean your party members survive an attack that would have killed them had the animation not taken so long. But despite the amount of fun I've had exploiting the advantages of a broken ATB system, I don't want to be unkillable. I want my hard learned buffs to matter, to actually see the effects of vanish or float pay off. I want the heat status effect that I cast on the enemy to actually kill them instead of wearing off before they even get to act. I want to actually get a chance to cast auto life or stona on a doomed or gradually petrified ally. I want the pros and cons of a functional time-based system. 
and I'm hoping that if a Final Fantasy IX Remake is going to reinstate the combat system, the least it can do is fix these issues, and in so doing, maybe make the animations not that slow anymore? That said, I'm not totally opposed to a new combat system, but anything that at least utilizes the strategies present in the original game, something that capitalizes on the status effects like heat where if you take any action in the next minute, you instantly die. Or trouble, where if you get hit, then the damage spreads to the rest of your party. Mechanics unique to Final Fantasy IX that really help it stand out from others in the series. Also, most of you may not know this, but the original PlayStation version had an option for multiplayer. Can we bring that back, please? Please? It was so much fun teaming up with my cousins, having them control two party members while I control the others. This is a bit of a lighter one, but a lot of people remark about how the end of Final Fantasy IX, specifically the final boss and themes of the final dungeon, seem to come out of nowhere. And while that might sound slightly hyperbolic, there is some validity to that sentiment. Final Fantasy IX is a game that has a lot of different themes regarding parts of people's existence, be it an individual or as a society or as a species. Each of your party members tackles their own part of life and present a theme that the game may want the player to think about, reflected in problems like solitude, sorrow, despair, etc. At the end of the game, the party goes through a place that offers a bit of philosophy regarding the nature of existence, having recently gone through the destruction of a dying planet that had been siphoning life from the party's current living planet. It's in all this consideration of life, death, what you'll be remembered as, if it's worth living, etc. that the final dungeon and final boss, in theory, feel rather relevant, reflecting on connections between the past, present, people's concept of memory, how thoughts connect and what is alive versus what is dead could be of some use to our party members in resolving any feelings they may have had left over from their journey. But the delivery of all this information feels purely academic and rather heavy-handed, which ends up making it feel more disconnected than it needs to be. Even when the themes are connected, the existence of the final boss still needs to be a bit more foreshadowed or explained. Honestly, I wouldn't mind if they made Daguerreo a mandatory visit, just so the party could learn about the fact that there might exist a being that has the purpose of returning the world to zero. That's a bit of lore that needs to be covered, to at least open the player up to the idea of having to deal with a being like Necron. Even Lion Turtles had more of a heads up than Necron does. A lot of people don't care for changes, while a lot of people are welcoming of them. But as my nostalgic favorite in the series, I simply can't see it being done justice if all its flaws are retained. I'm sure there are other flaws people can come up with that might need addressing, or just modern sensibilities that the game should have. But for me, even an attempt to deal with these three things would be much appreciated. Even if it means trying something new in other areas and not quite hitting the mark. I don't need Square to do everything the way I recommended in this video, nor do I need their execution to be perfect. All I want is an attempt at improving anything, even if it's as small as adding one single new ATE for Freya. So let me know what you guys may agree with or disagree with in the comments. What do you want to see in a new remade version of Final Fantasy IX? You can leave a like or a dislike as it suits your experience watching this video, but regardless, you have my thanks for watching to this point. Anyway. That's it. Bye.